Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have John Cameron, the author of uh, uh, Rekill, Rewire, and the forthcoming, uh, soon to appear, aristocracy, and uh, uh, development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation, along with Philip Lorea, who is uh, the author of Minute Dot and a uh, financial advisor here in Sacramento. Uh, this is in your bailiwick, uh, uh, Philip. The, uh, the stock market has uh, g gained volatility once again. Uh, it turns out that in the last couple of weeks there have been a number of tweets on whether or not uh, China and the United States are moving closer or farther away from getting to uh, a trade deal. <coughs> so there's, there's conflicting views on the importance of uh, trade as far as the uh, economy of the United States, as far as the uh, economic health of the country. How important is a $200 billion uh, tariff uh, or tariffs on $200 billion in, in trade in a $20 trillion economy. Is it important at all, or, or, or is it being overestimated? It's uh, being vastly overestimated. It's important to China, uh, but it is uh, irrelevant to us. And probably the most misleading thing that I'm seeing out there now is that it amounts to a tax on American people that if uh, there's a tariff, a 25% tariff on a Chinese import of tenor, tennis shoes, that this amounts to a 25% tax increase on Americans for those tennis shoes. <laughs> that has never been true. And it, uh, Why is that not true? Uh, because even the government itself, for instance, will exclude um, food from the price of inflation, its core inflation, because the fact is, is that if Nicaragua will produce a shoe for $10, now the Chinese shoe that was $10 is $12.50, the American consumer can still choose the $10 sneaker. But, so, the, but, but the $10 sneaker might go up in price as a uh, uh, opportunistic price increase on the part of Nicaragua. Well, and that's where you get into a free market system. And so here you've got Walmart. But the, the, if but you look the, at but, a, but the, Yeah, but the, look at, the look overall at pressure is going to be for prices to go up, right? It, it, it has never been. Uh, what will happen is Nicaragua, Vietnam, will say this is our opportunity. Uh, but what really happens, the way business really happens, is that Walmart you know, a quarter, quarter of a, a trillion dollars a year in sales. A massive clout says, hey, China, we can, China can no longer supply sneakers at the price point we, our consumers are willing to pay. Nicaragua, we will build your factories. We will pay you to build those factories to produce those sneakers for $10. Vietnam, we will do that. And so, Walmart is always going to be the one to say, hey, look, our consumer won't pay $12.50. They will pay $10. We know that. And we're going to find a way to get $10 done on this pair of sneakers. That means China is either going to lose, is either going to have to drop its price to make up for the tariff, or is going to have to raise its prices and lose business. It's but just Walmart just had their earnings announcement. Did they not they uh, say yeah. that they were going to pass along some of the uh, tariff price increases to the to the consumer level. Well, you know, Walmart can say that. Uh, Are you saying that they were not being forthcoming? I'm saying that Walmart is a, a, one of our largest American companies, and when we look at, for instance, let's take another area. When we look at the gas tax in California, how much it actually is versus how much more Californians pay per gallon of gas than anywhere else in the country now. It's not all the brown tax. You better believe the oil company said, hey, everybody along our supply chain is paying this tax. We've got to, if the additional tax was an additional 18 cents, we've got to charge an additional 72 cents. That's just the way it is, folks. I, I, I still can't get away from the fact that if you, if a government is taking a, a, a larger slice of the uh, of the uh, retail dollar, which a tariff does. A tariff increases the price by the amount of the tariff, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, barring uh, the uh, reduction in profit margins on the producer's end. Uh, if more money is going into government coffers, that means consumers are paying more. Some estimates say that uh, the no, cost of tariffs, true, the that's cost not, of tariffs will, 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 will go up as much as seven hundred dollars per household. You're that's saying not, that's, that's not, true? not quite true, right? Why not? The government can collect the money from China for the privilege of importing their goods into our country. There is no guarantee that those goods will sell at the consumer level. Well, absolutely. Or at what price they will sell. That, so that's why I say it, do, is, it is not quite true. To the extent that they do, prices go up. So to the extent any... that Nicaragua or Vietnam or Cambodia or whoever 
comes in there and says, we'll, uh, you know, $10, $12, $50, we'll, we'll come in at $11. Prices still go up a little bit. Well, and that, that's where we get to the place where uh, the market, and we see this, oddly enough, in the economists and the Federal Reserve scratching their head, why inflation keeps going down. Yes, Johnny. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Um, I still think that there's a, we're talking about what's going to happen and the tariffs and everything else. I, I'm not saying um, that uh, Trump's a genius. I'm not saying I like him. Occasionally I do because he's entertaining as hell. And he, he if you like worldwide somewhere. wrestling, he's entertaining, yeah. yes. Well, but here's the deal. Um, and we talked about this on, on many shows. Uh, <laughs> you know, he goes through all this stuff about tariffs. And, and, you know, again, China says one thing and does another, especially on the pollution front. They say, you know, that, that, that we're really concerned about. And then they're building a coal-fired plant every week. But, you know, they say, we're going to play by the rules and we're going to do this and we're going to follow the trade agreements that, and, and we're not going to steal intellectual property and all the rest. And then they just do whatever they want. Uh, he'll, he'll go off on these rants. And then, then the last thing he says before he leaves the press conference is, you know, this is, it, why don't we just eliminate all tariffs? So... Is this the final move in the, in the chess game to, to get the you know the governments of the world to sit down and say, let's level the playing field everywhere? And I'm I'm hoping that's the case. But then again, he's I think that's hope springs eternal is what yeah, I think. I'm, I'm a hopeful guy. I'm a, I'm an optimist. But then again, you know he is paying the farmers for the losses that they're taking yeah. because of the parents. give me more so, money. Yeah. So um, oh wait, you're one of the farmers. Yeah, I am. One of the <laughs> poor. Farmers. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But in any case, 25% uh, on $200 billion is uh, $50 billion in a $20 trillion economy. It's literally a rounding error. And so it, 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 literally it happens. Well, no I mean, whatsoever. we have the advantage of being a very, very large economy right. with the ability, uh, if necessary, to manufacture things ourselves. Uh, we certainly haven't uh, forgotten how. Not in California, though. And, Manufacturing is and, illegal and, in California. And, and, and there's a whole third world out there that's, that's as you pointed out, that's willing to, to uh, step in and do what China has been doing. So, yeah, I mean, even without tariffs, China was starting to lose uh, market share to Bangladesh and other countries that are doing it for uh, less of a labor cost than the labor cost in China, because mm -hmm. labor costs in China have been going up. So the, the next question is, we have seen uh, a, a, you know, a massively expansive monetary policy uh, with, the, uh, with uh, low interest rates and, and uh, quantitative easing going on for, for decade, over a decade now. Is that going to eventually lose, lead to anything other than inflation and assets? I realize that the reason we haven't seen consumer price inflation that much is because all of that money has been sloshing into the stock market instead. Is and that about to, is that about yeah. to change with with uh, with uh, tariff pressures and and uh, so forth? Uh, you know, it, uh, they have not been able to figure out why inflation has has just simply shown no trace. And in fact, it is what they consider to be what they would consider to be worryingly low now. They said that they had this tiny little target of 2% on 2 the upside. 2% means is, you lose half your money in 35 years. I don't consider that low. It, it, it is, uh, given their, their measurement, uh, given their margin of error, and then to say that 1.5% would be uh, a cause for action to simulate. So the margin of error, is, it's too low if it's 1.5%, it's too high if it's 2%. And a lot of I that mean, discussion. I'm, I'm arguing with the whole idea that two percent is okay. Well, you lose half your money in 35 years. Zero? I right. think that's I think that's insane. Right. And uh, price stability being defined as as price increases rather yeah, than that's, price that's, stability. Yeah, that's just that's Orwellian to say but, the least. But it's falling. It's not rising. It's falling. And the reason that it is falling, and I part of this is anecdotal. I tell you, I sit at a lot of kitchen tables with people who think about how they want to spend their money. Uh, and the other part of it is uh, uh, the macro data supporting it. The fact is, is that uh, anyone who is a paycheck employee is losing half their income. So you're talking about through taxes and so uh, through forth. Through taxes, 40% yeah. uh, pre-tax and 10% post-tax. 
So what's really been happening is when we talk about wage, you know, wages being mute, wage gains being muted at best and stagnant over the last 40 years, it been worse than that. They've actually been declining rapidly because you look at, especially look here in California. You have to work more hours today to buy, the, uh, to buy a Ford F-150 pickup than you did 40 years ago. But here is the thing that I see, and here's the anecdotal evidence. You are seeing this proliferation of barter sites, you know, let go, offer up, next door, and they're all over the place. Web thing, hey, you come by, I'll buy your, I'll post my dresser online, you know, you look at it, you leave $20 under the mat. Our, our economy, we call it the gig economy. Uh, I got a guy, you know, you go get a contractor, he says that job's gonna cost 20 grand. I got a guy, he'll do it for two, no taxes. So what's happening is our workers are, and why our labor force participation rate is seemingly so low, is that our workers have really gone away from the model that the government can track. And prices are set at whatever the market will bear. I look at that dresser and I say, I would pay $25 for that. Uh, in the store, that thing might be you know, $300 and going up. And so what's really happened is we have this underground economy that is much vaster than people imagine, not only from that, paycheck, I, but from uh, sales and purchases. I, I hate to interrupt, but I, 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 the numbers that they throw around seem to me to be ridiculously low when I count the number of people that I know are pretty much working underground. Mm -hmm. Well, theoretically, I know these people. Um, what do you think that number is on our $20 trillion economy? We do can almost we can all, trillion? Do you, you think can, it's uh, four trillion? Do you think uh, it's three trillion? What I would approach it, it I would approach it from the standpoint of the labor force participation rate. And so if you want to know how many people are working that are not declared but are actually working uh, and saying that we have a good economy, and I, you know, I would say that we do, GDP seems to indicate that, uh, because GDP still captures the underground world. Uh, I, I may have made underground money from you, but I'll go out and spend it somewhere. And so ultimately it does get captured. But if we wanted to quantify just how big this underground economy might be, it's probably got about 10 million workers in it. That's how many workers we seemingly lost of age-eligible uh, age people who dropped out of the economy uh, at the height of the great uh, the financial collapse and have never come back. Well, well no, I mean, the, no, the labor force millions. participation rate is back to 1960, 1970 levels when uh, women were not participating in the labor force to the extent that well, they are. And then you have, to, you have to take into account that three to four million of those that were on the, on the employment rolls are now on Social Security disability income. It doesn't matter. In fact, in this last report that was a pretty decent report on the surface, what caught everybody's attention was the uh, massive decline in labor force participation in the age range between 25 and 54. Half a million people fell off the rolls, uh, the stopped participating in the labor force. And that is a, and those are ages that exclude education and exclude early retirement, the civil servants. No, people are choosing, and I can just tell you conversations I have with, you know, one of the fastest growing industries is home care, you know, the aging population. You can go through, someone works for an agency and they get paid uh, IHSS and they'll get paid $13 an hour. But if they network appropriately and get a little bit of a reputation, they can go directly to the person who needs the home care and they can get paid $15 an hour, go out to care.com, and all of it's cash money. So this person is going from the equivalent of a $13 an hour job taking home Seven. Eight, Eight, seven, yeah, to taking versus yeah. taking it all home, and so we are seeing the spending of that fourteen dollars in the the real economy, the grocery store, the you know gas pump, what have you. But what we are missing is the uh, the data, the the government collected data saying that these people are working. Interesting. Uh, one of the other things that you would be familiar with is the. Uh, the whole asset allocation model. Whenever one uh, asset classification or asset uh, goes up, another asset category might go down. And historically, gold and uh, precious metals have gone up, while stocks and uh, and bonds have gone down. 
the non-correlated assets. Now it looks like uh, the uh, asset that's going up is crypto. Is there uh, a substitution of crypto for precious metals in uh, investment circles? You know, I think so. I uh, have been doing this a long time. And it used to be exactly as you described. And so, you know, the average uh, uh, advisor would say, keep 5% of precious metals in your portfolio. That's your insurance hedge. And what we have found, especially in this last run, where uh, this last run of volatility from October to December, particularly, and then when we had, you know, kind of this hit here over the last couple of weeks, um, gold and silver didn't go up at all. In fact, silver down. And, um, and yet, during that same period of time, uh, Bitcoin went from $3,000 a coin to over $7,000. So clearly, the, while the stock market was rising, you could track the decline of Bitcoin from almost $20,000 a Bitcoin down to $3,000. And yet, when the stock market started to get volatile, you started to see Bitcoin as sort of the proxy for all of them just start to soar, while gold and precious metals didn't do a darn thing. And so this is all relatively new in my field, is to say, hey, you know, the insurance hedge against falling stock markets and bond markets isn't precious metals anymore, it's cryptocurrency. The problem is, is there's not, there, there isn't any real good way to invest in crypt cryptocurrency other than to go out and buy the stuff. Well, yeah, there's that, and, and it would seem to me that the whole premise of cryptocurrency uh, depends on government tolerance, because if the government comes with guns and says, turn over your cryptocurrency, there's not a whole lot that uh, the holders of cryptos can do to fight off government who is bound and determined to stop uh, the, uh, the accumulation or the ownership of, of Bitcoin or any other crypto. Well, and the problem is that they haven't figured they would love to do that. Uh, and it is an existential threat. I, I honestly thought that it was the most important thing that would happen in the 21st century. It would be the, you know, uh, or, or 20, uh, so the possibility that people could chain, exchange goods and services with money that was strictly the store of value given to it, that uh, entirely market determined also had profound implications to taxation and tax revenue. Uh, and so they'd like to stop it, but you can't say that it's illegal. It's just there's nothing, there is no law on the books yet that says... Well, there could be very quickly. You know, if I say, hey, Richard, I will, I've got a bag of jelly beans and I'll trade it for that pen, uh, there's nothing in the law that prevents us from doing that with each other. And that's essentially all cryptocurrency is, is saying, hey, you know, I've got this thing. Bag, bag of jelly beans. It's a bag of jelly beans. <laughs> so how would, if, if okay, so let's, okay, how yeah. would you classify it? Is, is, is crypto, uh, you know, we have laws in this country that protect property rights. They're trampled on by the government constantly. But when push comes to shove, if the government just takes some of your stuff, well, your property, it, uh, then it's required to compensate you for it. So um, if... If the government decided that that uh, that it was just going to um, create a law and pass a law that says that that uh, um, cryptos are are, are um, currency and private individuals aren't allowed to the only the only the, only the government of the United States can create currency, which is basically part of our rule of law, and actually pursue it. So what we're going to do is we're going to take your your false currency that you're using from you because you're violating the law. Would would private individuals be able to do anything about it? Because you know basically the rule of law in this country says that the only entity that can create currency is the federal government. But here here's why this works. And first of all, cryptocurrency is paid for with you know real money. In other words, if you want to buy a coin, you've got to put out whatever the going rate is, let's say $7,000 today. Mm -hmm. so, th so that answers that first question. The second question is I have $7,000 and I decide to buy um, a used car. I turn around and I say, hey, I just, I'm, John, will you buy my used car for $9,000? Uh, John may or may not do it. But, and that's where the cryptocurrency lives and while, it, while it's legal is because it was purchased with currency. It is a thing and its value is whatever people agree its value is. And it could be 3000 it could be 19000 it could be 7000 Whatever the market says it's worth that day is what it's worth. It could be baseball cards for all we know. 
So that's why I'm, that's the answer to the question. They're not actually creating a currency itself. What they are doing is creating a thing, and that thing that thing's value is determined by the market on a daily basis, uh, based on the whole world of currency. So what's Facebook coin going to be worth? Uh, whatever people say it's worth. Yeah. Whatever. So is, is, is a Facebook great example, by the way. Of, uh, Facebook they're, they're talking about doing a cryptocurrency called well, Facebook. Well, if, if Facebook, and Facebook is marketplace in it? is one of those um, uh, under the table operations that's so popular, look at the reach of Facebook. Go out on marketplace; it's one of their most popular uh, features. Nobody really cares about catching up with anybody anymore. Uh, my son got his job on Facebook marketplace. It's a much bigger thing. Facebook has gone away from being a social media company, although that reputation hasn't died. Now it's a very, you know, uh, the messenger app is made to exchange money. And now with the currency, it can do it. Uh, so Facebook is setting up a whole uh, digital marketplace of real things. Well, as untrustworthy as Facebook uh, was with privacy and access to various government agencies and manipulating news and all the rest of that, are, are we really uh, eager to place our financial well-being in their hands? I'm not. <laughs> but when we look at those big players, whether it's Amazon, uh, especially Amazon, uh, that uh, uh, really its core business is gathering data and selling it to other people. In fact, Facebook's Core, you know, uh, a source of revenue is collecting data on mm -hmm. all of us and selling that to merchants and saying, This person might buy this. You want to take out an ad? And that's Facebook's basic business model. But Facebook is going away from that and now is becoming this um, um, bazaar, B A Z A R, uh, of its own coin, its own marketplace. Uh, the Messenger app is designed to exchange money. Uh, it is becoming, it is its own sort of, you know, it's becoming Amazon, if you will. But at the end of the day, what it's going to boil down to with all of these companies and Google the same, that what they're really collecting is your data. And that is a vast uh, uh, value to the governments and to everyone else. If the product uh, is free, you are the product. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's interesting in the, in the whole uh, scheme of things is, uh, I mean, we're, we're looking at people being afraid in the stock market, hence the stock market becomes more volatile, goes down. We're looking at people being afraid uh, that uh, Trump will get reelected or, or the reverse, depending on who you are. A lot of fear going on and an awful lot of uh, uh, political... Uh, fear mongering. Fear mongering yeah. and an awful lot of, uh, you know, take no prisoners politics going on uh, when it comes to Democrats uh, that hate Trump and Trump, Trumpsters that hate, uh, that hate Democrats. One of the things that's concerning to me is we are seeing war clouds start to, to form. It has to do with tariffs as well. In Venezuela, flights have been suspended as war hawks uh, gain ascendancy in the Trump White House. In uh, Iran, we're seeing the uh, troops being withdrawn, or not troops, but the non-essential personnel being withdrawn from Iraq, neighboring Iran. Are the John Boltons, are the Pompeos, are the, the, uh, the serious war hawks gaining ascendancy in the Trump White House? Are we looking at uh, a wag the dog war? Um, I think that we're, you don't need to have a war to distract from uh, lunacy. You just need to have what you talked about, fear of war. So this is... But uh, it, yeah, you, know, if you is, can have fear is, of war, yeah. but that can also turn into war, as we saw with the pictures from that Colin Powell showed at the UN, that turned into a war in Iran. Now they're showing pictures of uh, alleged uh, Iranian uh, small boats with missiles. That could and, turn into and, a war and very easily. They're showing pictures of oil tankers being sabotaged and blaming it on um, uh, Iran and and all the rest of that stuff. It, it, could it could it turn into war? Yes, I think easily. No, um, it's it's a long ways off. Even though we have uh, we, when you have a toy, when you have a shiny toy, you you. So I'm I'm just talking out of both sides of my 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 mouth here, um, simultaneously. Uh, we have this war machine, and when you have a war machine, um, you use it. 
you know, you, if, if you have the people there and the training and blooded troops and, and you're constantly striving, you know, for a mission, um, you know, we would think that that, that would be, uh, you know, kind of a deterrent. But it's been our history, U.S. history, to stick our nose in. So one part of me is saying that, that you know, it, it might not be an all-out war, but I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we don't do a little bombing and a little cruise missileing and some, um, some uh, sabotage of our own uh, and some intimidation because we, we have this war machine that's, uh, that's so effective and powerful. But I don't think we're going to have, um, you know, like an invasion of, of another country in, in the Middle East again. Well, we shouldn't forget the oil factor. Only it's reversed. The U.S. is the number one oil producing nation in the world. We put sanctions on Iran saying no other country can buy oil from Iran. Who are they going to buy the oil from? They have US. to buy it from the U.S. Good for well, our shale producers, the whole thing. If we, can uh, get, if we can get the oil anywhere. I mean, uh, West Texas uh, uh, Brent is, is 10 bucks cheaper than, than West Texas because we can't, we can't get the oil anywhere. We don't have, I mean, we can get, it's, it should be the same price based upon shipping costs and everything. You know, the, the fact that it's in uh, somewhere else in the world, but, but that differential. And, you know, the, the anti, the Luddites here and the, the pro-environmental people and all the rest of that prevent the infrastructure being put into place that would make those, our oil competitive. But, and we're still the biggest producer. And have, have they, um, there was a, 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 a rule, uh, a law during the Carter era about exporting. Um, uh, that was the last thing that, that Obama did was, uh, natural uh, gas? was, was um, re rescind that order. It was the Nixon yeah, administration. Now we can, uh, we now can we export. export natural gas. Yeah. So here we have the top three producers in the world. The U.S. is number one. Russia has allowed, uh, allied itself with OPEC uh, as the number two producer, agreeing to cut uh, production. You've got the Saudis being number three. For natural gas they, or for, for, for Well, petroleum. natural gas is free. They're flaring yeah. it off again. They're just burning it. Uh, so two and three have said, you know, we're allied with Iran, and Iran is not going to be allowed to sell oil. Uh, they can't up production because that breaks their alliance. It breaks OPEC. It's a pretty shrewd move in my move on uh, Trump's part. He is putting, he's putting, He's putting the U.S. in a place of, look, we'll replace all the oil we take off the market. In a uh, War clouds are forming. I don't care what you say. That's the show. <laughs> we'll see you again next week, same time, same place on the Libertarian Counterpoint. Thank you very much for being part of the show. Well, thank you, Richard. And I, I hope you're wrong.